All right, tonight we're going to be in Esther chapter 4, and we're going to hopefully cover 4 through 6. Um, a little bit of disclaimer, I know Carson likes to do disclaimers in class, or when he's preaching. Um, some of the topics that we're going to cover tonight are kind of near and dear to my heart and uh, emotional, so I'm going to try to make it through, um, but if I don't, I'll you know, ask you to please be patient with me. Uh, what you're looking right now, as far as the photo, let me know what this is actually before I tell you what it is. It's some sort of pastry. Hopefully nobody's hungry. Um, this is uh, as this pastry has a specific name and it's called uh, Haman Tashen and it is used for Purim, which is uh, a, a holiday celebrated by the Jews even today, 2500 years later. They celebrate their delivery from uh, from death from from Haman and so these are loosely translated Haman's pockets or Haman's ears. Um, and I don't know exactly all of the intricacies, but basically they're kind of making fun of Haman with, the, with these pastries. But the, the feast that we read about in Esther chapter 9, verse 22, or starting in verse 22, I believe, um, where they were um, where they were told, let's see, as the days on which um, the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days of sending gifts or of food to one another and gifts for the poor. That still happens today and the Jews still celebrate this holiday. Haman is long gone, but, but they're still around, so. Curtis? User error. Okay. Um, so let's just set the, 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 the context, the historical context. Um, these, these events that we're going to read about, they have taken place about 2,500 years ago. And that's a long time in the land that's unfamiliar to us. And so it's easy to look at them and just, you know, be kind of detached, right? And just study it as pure history and understand the historical facts and just kind of move on but we're dealing with real people um, that had real suffering and that, that that were affected by by all these events so i think tonight if we can try to try to put ourselves somewhat in their shoes so there's a tragedy that happened in 722 bc when 10 out of 12 tribes of israel were taken into captivity and they were lost forever the two tribes of Ju Judah and Benjamin were the southern um, southern portion of that king, or the, the new kingdom uh, that was a southern kingdom, but the northern kingdom of Israel contained people from 10 tribes, and they were all taken away, never to be heard again. So now the Jews, uh, who are very proud of their lineage, nobody can trace their lineage to these people. They either got killed or they got assimilated, and probably at some point even joined, their descendants joined the ranks of the enemies of the Jews. But thousands upon thousands of people disappeared, they stopped being a nation, they lost their national identity, and they're gone. And so that's something to, to remember and it's something to treat uh, with respect as, as a tragedy that befell them. We are in the, the southern, um, we're dealing with the southern kingdom of, of Judah. So um, 478 BC is when, um, when King, uh, Queen Esther, when Esther became queen. So the events that happened before then was that uh, around 605 BC, the first wave of uh, people of Judah were taken uh, into captivity by Babylon and the two more waves after that. Um, some of these people would have been in captivity for over 100 years. So in 538 BC, 539 Persia takes over and defeats Babylon, becomes a world power. In the next year, uh, King Cyrus issues an edict to allow the Jews to return um, and rebuild the temple. They start doing that in 536 BC, a couple of years later. The temple is rebuilt, um, the second temple is rebuilt in 516 BC. Uh, but there's still people in exile, and so including um, uh, including um, 
Esther and Mordecai and a lot of other Jews are currently living in Persia. Persia is a very wide empire, um, as um, chapter one tells us. It spans from Ethiopia to India. That's that's a pretty good chunk of land, um, and so it's inhabited by the Jews are scattered throughout that. If you just think about this, <clears throat> the Jews have not had their own nation since um, since the fall of both Israel and Judah. They, they see and they have never had that uh, again. We can we'll talk about 1948, but uh, until 1948, they were always living in somebody else's country. I know that because we did that. My family did that. Uh, my family is from Ukrainian Jews that were saved from the Holocaust by moved, my grandparents moved to, to Russia in, in, um, in 1940s, escaped. Their, their parents did not escape the Holocaust, but they did. Um, and we lived as an ethnic uh, Jewish minority uh, surrounded by the majority, the, the Russian uh, majority, the Soviet uh, people's majority. So it's very different when you're always, uh, you're not a guest in somebody's country, you are an outsider, and they treat you as an outsider. Uh, you never belong. Um, so to us as Americans, that's kind of foreign, right? Um, especially those of you who were born in this nation, you, you have been granted um, rights and, and responsibilities of a citizen from day one. You enjoyed those freedoms, you never doubted them for a second. It's very different when you are a stranger in somebody's land and you're hated uh, to some extent. And so these people are living in exile and they can only return to the land of their forefathers if, some, if, if, if the king allows that. So there's lots, lots of limitations, lots of fear. And this fear is heightened now because of Haman. Uh, who was Haman? What, what is he? What was his role? as far as the king of Persia. He was, um, we're gonna we find out that he was one of the officials and uh, for an unknown to us reasons in chapter three, uh, starting verse one, King Ahasuerus of Persia promotes Haman. He promotes Haman. He becomes most elevated of all the, of all the king's um, uh, servants and um, he demands that people pay homage to him and bow down to him. And the king actually supports that. In verse three, we know that's actually king's command that everybody needs to pay homage to him. Uh, Mordecai is a Jew and he doesn't, he doesn't follow this, right? He does not bow down before Haman. He's not afraid of Haman. Um, he explains it to the other officials by the fact that he is a Jew. We're not told necessarily exactly um, how that correlates. Um, my guess would be that um, if he is a God-fearing Jew, the only Lord he has is, is, is Lord, and is Adonai, and he's not going to bow to a Persian um, official. But regardless, um, Haman finds out about it. He finds out that, that he's a Jew. And so in verse 3, we find out that Haman sought to... Uh, an early, uh, um, and, and how do you pronounce this? Annihilate, thank you. Annihilate all the Jews, the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So Haman has beef with one person and he extrapolates to the entire nation of people he doesn't know and that is spread geographically throughout uh, this huge empire, right? Who does that remind you of in more modern times? Somebody who hated the Jews and wanted to kill them all. This guy. Right? And the reason I bring this up, and just for, for a few minutes, we're going to divert from the story itself. Because once again, it's super easy just to think about this as a story. Somebody got impacted. Okay, they, you know, okay, they did. Imagine if somebody hated an American somewhere away from here and was so angry that he decided that I'm, I'm just gonna kill them all. Men, women, children, babies, everybody, right? Just because they're Americans. Not only that, but he had actual power to do so. What would that be like? So this man here, Adolf Hitler, is one of the most evil human beings ever walked, who ever walked to this earth, at least in our memory, right? What he said in 1939 to the Parliament of Germany, that's only been 85 years ago. 
was this. The peoples of the earth will soon realize that Germany under National Socialism, which are the Nazis, do not desire the enmity of other peoples. Now, now obviously, a lot of these things are pure, pure lie, but that's what he said. I want, I want once again to be a prophet. If the international finance jury inside and outside of Europe should succeed in plunging the peoples of the earth once again into a world war, the result will, will be not the Bolshevization of earth, and thus a Jewish victory, but an uh, annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. That's what he said in 1939. By the time Hitler was defeated, over six million Jews were murdered. This man not only had the desire to kill them all, but he had the means to do so, and he spent an enormous amount of energy doing just that. This is a photograph of one of the uh, either concentration camps or death camps. Hitler built a whole network. I didn't know this until recently, but uh, there were different types of camps. There was concentration camps, there were labor camps, there were death camps. Um, and they have devised this uh, enormously efficient and effective machine to, um, to, kill, to kill the Jews. Um, if you've never been to a Holocaust Museum, I invite you to go. It, it is an unbelievable uh, experience. So I, my mother and I were in Poland um, a few years ago. We actually went and, and, and stood outside of Schindler's factory. Um, there was an opportunity to go to Auschwitz, which is one of these camps. Uh, we debated whether to do it or not. We decided not to do it. It was just, it was just too difficult. But um, this is what happens when a man with means to do so decides he's gonna murder this many people. And so this isn't 2,500 years ago, this is 85 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so this story of Esther is personal. It is highly personal to me. And so I'm really glad that I got an opportunity to, to speak to you about this. So <clears throat> this is even more personal. This is a famous photograph and out of respect for uh, people involved, and, and just in case we had a small uh, child in the audience, I, I blurred out, I, I, I put a blur on this photograph. But what you're seeing is a man in a sitting position in the, in the center. Um, what's below him that's fuzzied out are the bodies of other Jews who were murdered, probably his family, probably his friends. And there are German soldiers standing around this hole, this, uh, this mass grave, with a German soldier pointing uh, a pistol of some kind at this man's head. And the caption that was given to this uh, picture is the last Jew in Vinitsa. Vinitsa happens to be a, city, a town in Ukraine where my entire extended family was murdered. So it's quite possible that this man is either a relative or a friend of my relatives, and they are in that pit. Not just somewhere in that location, because as far as we know, they were murdered in 1942, and this picture was taken sometime between 41 and 43. This is what happens when evil is allowed to reign. And we must treat this story of Haman as evil and not just a Bible story. So <clears throat> the Jews said, never again. We're not going to allow anyone to treat us this way. We're not, we, we, need a, we need a place, we need a home. We need a place where, we, where nobody is going to kick us out of or threaten us. So there's a complex history with Britain and the British mandate and so forth. We're not, we don't have the time to go into it and I don't have the understanding of it. But regardless, in May of uh, 1948, Israel declares independence. The same day they declared independence, uh, the war broke out and they've been fighting wars with their neighbors for, um, for many, many years since then. So off and on. But they finally had again, a country of their own. Now, there's a big debate whether this, the modern state of Israel, whether that is something sanctioned by God or if whether that's just purely man's uh, invention. So I, I don't have the answer for that. 
uh, one thing we do know that the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he fulfilled. He brought them to their land. Whether the modern state of Israel is a continuation of that, I don't know. Once again, it's debatable. But from a political perspective, there is now one, once again um, a country called Israel with, with the Jews living as, as, as citizens. And, and this was really done because of this. They said, never again there will be a tyrant who can put us in concentration camps and burn us and gas us and kill our children. It's not going to happen. Well, that lasted for a while, but not indefinitely. I want you to, I want you to, it's hard for you to read this, so I'm going to read this for you, but there's a couple of, um, a couple of quote, quote, quotes, and, and this is not meant to be political in any way. These are factual. I'm just reading what, um, some factual statements. So in, in 1968, um, there was a, there was a Congress of, um, uh, Arabic Congress around Palestine. And so they, they created a Palestinian charter and article nine of this says armed struggle is the only way to liberate Palestine. And it is therefore a strategy, uh, a strategy and not a tactic. The Palestinian Arab people affirm its absolute resolution and abiding determination to pursue the armed struggle and to march forward toward the armed popular revolution to liberate its homeland and restore its right to a natural life and to exercise its right of self-determination national sovereignty. Armed struggle is the only way to liberate Palestine, they said. 1968, Hamas issued uh, 2017, uh, 2017 um, issued a document with their doctrine. Article 20 says, Hamas believes that no part of the land of Palestine shall be compromised or ceded, irrespective of the causes, the circumstances and the pressures, and no matter how long the occupation lasts. Listen to this. Hamas rejects any alternative to the full and complete liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. The phrase from the river to the sea, we recently all heard this. It, it refers to destroying all the Jews in what is considered Palestine. So, less than, less than six months ago, October 7th, 2023, Hamas entered the, the south, southern portion of Israel and in cold blood murdered 1,200 men, women, and children, took 253 people hostage, and many of them died Many of them still remain hostages because this organization said, we're not going to rest until we kill them all. These people, just like Hitler, are prototypes of Haman. That's what he wanted to do. And we're going to find out he's not able to do, he wasn't able to do this, but there have been since men of pure evil who have. So as we read the story tonight, I want us to think about events of less than six months ago. These are real people, and this is a real tragedy. So we're going to go back to our story now. And uh, in chapter three, we find out that the way that Haman is pulling this off is that he's bribing uh, King Ahasuerus. He gave him a sum of money. I was trying to do some math. He gave him 10,000 talents. My Bible says that a talent is about 75 pounds of silver. So that's 750,000 pounds of silver at the current prices of silver today, that is $260 million. Now, I don't know how, how it was priced in, in Persia, but regardless, even if, it's, uh, even if it's off, he gave him a lot of money. And somehow, miraculously, Ahasuerus said, yep, sure, here's my signet ring. You just do whatever you want to do. You've got the money, you've got people, just go do your thing. And so in verse 12 of chapter 3, we see that, that, they, that, that Haman is issuing an edict and, and seals it with a, with a king's signet ring. And uh, they're sending it throughout the entire country um, in every language. And they're, they're addressing the governors and the officers. And uh, the, the, um, the edict is to destroy kill and, and annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children in one day. That sounds awfully familiar now. 
By the way, this wasn't a secret. They all knew it. Right? The Jews found out about this. This was not something that was, was just told to non-Jews. It was a year. So when they sent this proclamation, they were going to kill them all on, on a day that was exactly 12 months from the time that this thing was signed. So you imagine living in fear for a year. It wasn't sudden. It was just that you knew it was coming a year from now. So, of course, the reaction to this was understandable of fear and agony. Uh, Mordecai, and so now we're in chapter 4, um, he's, he learns, he's in Susa, the, the, the capital city, one of the capital cities. He learns about it. He is completely distraught. He tears his clothes. He puts on ashes and sackcloth, and he cries uh, bitterly, and as, as it says in verse 1. He goes to the entrance of the, of the gate. He's not allowed to enter because the Persian law stated that anybody wearing sackcloth couldn't enter the king's gate. So he is in front of the gate in complete distress. Other Jews are fasting and weeping and lamenting. And um, so it, it is a scene of, of utter um, just human tragedy that is, that is impending. In verse 4, the young women and eunuchs come and they tell Esther uh, about this distress. She doesn't have all the details yet. Uh, she understands that he, is, uh, that, he, that he tore his clothes and he's wearing sackcloth, so she provides some clothes for him. He refuses, um, and he basically explains. So they, they're having this conversation um, throughout, you know, through the, um, not face-to-face -face because he's not even allowed to enter the palace, um, through, through her servants. And um, so she, um, so she learns now the the um, what exactly happened. Verse seven that that she learns the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay, um, and even receives a copy, a written copy of the of the decree um, from uh, from Mordecai. So now she has um, full picture of what is what devastation is about to ensue. And so uh, Mordecai asks her to do something. Actually, it more than ask. I think he pretty much orders her to do something. By the way, what is what is their relationship before we dive into that? How are they related? They're cousins, but he she, he is more of a father figure to her. He raised her. She was an orphan. So there's a tremendous amount of love and respect between these two. Um, and we see her compassion on him as. Um, as she knows he's distressed, and then he is, is urging her um, to be of help. What, uh, what is her reaction to that? What does, she, what does she tell him? What, what's, the, what's the issue? He asks her, to, hey, you need to go to your husband, the king, and you need to plead for your people. That's, that's the ask. Now, we know that Mordecai told everybody he was a Jew, right? So that's known. But based on his uh, advice, at least in the beginning of this relationship uh, between Esther and, and her husband, uh, he did, the king did not know she was Jewish. Now, I don't know if he knows this by now or not, but he didn't know. And so now Mordecai is asking her to go on behalf of her people. This is the time to reveal yourself um, and, um, and, to, and to beg the king uh, for, for your people. Now, she is reluctant. Why would she be reluctant to do that? She hadn't been summoned yet. Now, this we learned something about Persia, right? So she is the queen, but she can't appear before the king until he summons her. Now, that, that rule applied to everyone, apparently including the queen. And so in that culture, if you were to enter the inner court of the palace and you weren't summoned, you weren't asked to come in, what was the punishment? Death. Now, that's foreign to us. So there's very few places that we would enter that it would, the, the end result would be death, right? Like, we've all been to the White House. You can't just go see the president, right? Um, and you probably wouldn't be allowed to buy security. But even if you try, and people have tried to breach, right? None of them were killed on the spot, right? They might have been arrested. They got in trouble legally. But in our country, you wouldn't die just because you entered a building of some kind, right, a, that had an official in it. But in their culture, that's how it was. Except, but there was an exception. What did the king have to do in order to spare your life? 
Yes, you, he had a, a golden scepter, which was um, a symbol of his uh, royal power. And if he extended you the, the, the golden scepter, then he basically forgave you and gave you grace and you would have been spared. So, um, so she's concerned. Um, in verse 11 of chapter 4, she says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if a man or woman goes and goes to the king's uh, inside the inner court without being called, there is one but there is one there is but one law to be put to death except the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that they may live. <clears throat> but as for me, I have not been called to come in to the king these 30 days. Now, that's a different kind of marriage, right? So the king and the queen haven't seen he hadn't called for her in 30 days. We know that he has a harem full of other women, so we don't have all the details in terms of how all that worked, but it's definitely a different kind of dynamics than uh, exists in our marriages. So it's, it's a little bit foreign to us, but that's, that's, that's her reality. She obeyed it. She didn't um, break any rules, so she, she was concerned. Now we get to one of the most famous passages in this, in this, in this chapters, in this exchange. Um, in verse 12 of chapter 4, and then, then Mordecai, let me see, sorry. Yeah, verse 12. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the, that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So he's very direct with her. He doesn't mince any words. He said, if you don't do this, yes, this is risky and you could die. But if you don't do this, then deliverance will be provided by someone else. There will be a way for the Jews to be saved. But as, and by the way, you, you wouldn't escape it even, even if you were in the palace because you were a Jew. And if you don't do this, there will be deliverance, but you and your, and your family will die. So pretty, um, pretty straightforward words. And then he says something that I think is gonna be the main lesson for us. And he says, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. A Jewish girl, an orphan, a nobody, becomes the queen of Persia. The, God's providence is seen in all of this, and um, Esther needs to recognize that, that her role is not just for her own benefit, that she was placed in this role for a reason. And that's a lesson we're going to learn from that as well. So she she does an amazing thing, and this reminded me of Mary when Gabriel told her she was going to have baby Jesus, and she immediately says, okay, I, if I die, I die. But, but in order to uh, ensure success, she asks him to, to take the Jews and, uh, and, pray, and, and, fee, uh, and uh, fast and pray uh, so that she'll be successful, which is, which is exactly what you want to do. And she didn't just go in you know, as a hero and marching into this palace, she wanted to make sure that she had God's blessing and, and through days of, of fasting and praying herself, her maidens and, um, and other people. And only after that, um, she said, okay, if I perish, then I perish. So chapter five begins that she uh, enters the, the inner court. She enters the place where she was not summoned um the king is there and um um he so she she won favor in the king's sight uh, and he holds out the golden scepter so she is um she's spared her, her life is not in, in any danger at the moment um what's interesting it's just kind of ironic in verse three he says what is your request you know ask for anything even half of the kingdom and he hasn't called her in 30 days it's like uh, why all of a sudden you're so so interested? I, I, I don't know. Don't want to don't want to try to get into psychology of King Ahasuerus, but um, apparently seeing her invoke some sort of emotions where he became very very generous and he and he wanted to give her what she was going to ask him for. 
And what she does is very, very clever, right? She doesn't just come out and say, hey, let's, let's stop your decree. You know, we're going to protect the Jews. Like, she, she's got this plan. I don't know how she came up with a plan. We don't, we're not told. I don't know if that's just her plan, if Mordecai somehow helped her, if she had a vision about the plan. I don't know. But, but the plan is super clever. Um, she's basically inviting the king uh, and Haman to a feast. And um, what we find out about, what we know about King Xerxes, he loves to drink. I mean, we've seen that before. He had this huge feast for all of his, uh, for 180 days, right? And then uh, within the seven-day feast, and they, the, the wine was free-flowing. So he, he really likes to drink. And so, uh, you know, she creates this opportunity um, for him. So he's once again asking her, what can I give you? up to half of the kingdom. And once again, she doesn't make a direct request. She says, hey, how about we have this party tomorrow too? And you know, you and Haman come. So they, Haman is very, very excited. In verse nine of chapter five, he goes home and he's just so, so excited that you know, he is the top, top dog, uh, top official, and um, he's got all this wealth. He has got this position of power. Um, and uh, and even the queen invited nobody else but the king and and, and him. So he is very um, he's super excited about that. But there's verse thirteen. He says, "Yet all of this is worth nothing to me," which is kind of an unusual statement, right? Somebody who's this arrogant and this proud, you would think he'd be so excited. What was this thing that kind of spoiled his his fun? And and uh, what was the problem? Mordecai. Mordecai is just won't just just won't let him alone, and 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 he just can't let go of this. This this Jew, this nobody, sitting in ashes and sackcloth at the gate, right? Will not fear, will not tremble, will not bow down. So all of this wonderful things that are in his life, just not enough. He just wants to get rid of Mordecai. So his family, they. They give him advice like, hey, why don't you get this guy killed before you go to the party tomorrow? And like, that's a wonderful idea. I'll get rid of this dude, and then I'm just going to party. It's going to be great. So he builds something. What does he build? A gallows. 75, no, 50, I'm sorry, 50 cubits, right? So once again, did some math. That is some tall gallows. That is 75 feet. That, so, I, so I, of course, I had to do a research. How, how, how tall a typical gallows? I mean, that's not something you, a question you ask every day. But, and I couldn't find the answer, so I did a little estimation. I'm, that, I was estimating based on pictures, like 20 to 25 feet max, right? This is 75 feet. Now, some people say that was because it was on the hill and it was from the, from the, from the base of the hill to the top of the gallow, maybe. But nonetheless, he spared no expense. He built these huge gallows. He's like, oh, I'm going to get rid of Mordecai once and for all. So chapter six opens up. The king, can't, the, the king is not able to sleep. So he brings this book that's going to definitely put him to sleep, which is the, the deeds of the king. And so he's reading about the, the two eunuchs that, that, that had a coup, that they wanted to, to, to kill him. But then, then he remembers that uh, Mordecai saved him. And so he asked this question, hmm, what, what did we do for Mordecai that he, that he saved my life? And uh, in verse 3, he gets this answer that, uh, that nothing has been done. That nothing has been done for Mordecai. So giving, giving him props, he actually is kind of bothered by that, right? And so he was like, oh, I, I should have done something for, for him. At that moment, Haman is entering um, the palace. We don't know what time it was, but it's early in the morning, most likely, because the king couldn't sleep and Haman couldn't wait to hang Mordecai. So he comes into the palace early and one of the funniest, I think, stories in the Bible takes place, right, of, of this, this comedy of errors. So the king is, is asking Haman for advice. What should I do to a man who is who's worthy and who is uh, the king was going to honor? So what does Haman think? Who is he talking about? Yeah, he's like, oh, this is, my, this is just my lucky day. I get to hang Mordecai. I get to go to a party. And before then, the king just thinks I'm so special and I need to be honored. So, of course, he proposes all these wonderful things, thinking that he's going to be the recipient. 
right? He needs the um, to ride on the, on the horse that the king has ridden on and wear the clothes that um, that the, the king the robe that the king has has worn, and somebody is going to walk in front of um, if in front of him. And he is going to declare that, like, this is the man that the, that the king did, uh, honors, right? And so the, so the king is super excited. He was like, oh, this is a wonderful idea. Go do this and don't leave anything out. Do exactly like you said, except what's the problem? Who did the king actually mean? Mordecai. I, can, I would have paid a lot of money. And most of you know I, I don't spend money. Um, <laughs> I just don't spend money, period. But um, to see Haman's face, I mean, the, I, he must have just been completely, completely destroyed. Um, so he does this because, you know, you have to obey the king. And in Persia, uh, as we know, right, the decree of the king was not even, you couldn't even un undo it. So he, he puts Mordecai on this horse, on the king's horse, and puts the king's robe on it and walks himself in front of the horse, in the market, uh, in the square, and he's, he is loudly proclaiming um, that uh, this is the way that a man is honored uh, by, by the king. I, I can't even imagine how those words tasted coming out of his mouth. So <clears throat> at the end of this little excursion, chapter uh, 6, verse 12, Mordecai goes back to the gate where he was uh, mourning and uh, cry, bitterly crying, and Haman goes hurriedly hose, goes into his own house, He's in mourning too, and his head is covered, and so he tells his wife and his friends, um, and it's interesting what they tell him. They say uh, in verse 13, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. I don't know exactly what they knew. I don't know if they knew of of the, Hebrew, of the God of the Jews, I, I, we're not necessarily told, but they have some sort of insight that this is probably bigger than Mordecai, right? And that anything that Haman is doing um, is just is just not going to succeed. So that's where, where chapter um, six ends. So what we're going to do in the last few minutes, I'm going to try to finish before the stop sign so Curtis doesn't throw it up uh, at me, but um, we're going to go back and the really the lesson, I mean, we can all learn lessons from Haman, right? I mean, that's pretty easy. Like, don't be envious, don't be hateful, don't, you know, uh, don't be arrogant. I mean, there's plenty of things that are on the surface that we can learn from, um, from Haman. But one thing I want us to go back to, and that's something that um, in, in, in chapter four, Mordecai told um, Esther in, in verse 14, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. How does this apply to all of us? We know God's plan at the high level, right? We know what the plan of salvation was. We know how the story ends. What we don't know is all the little tiny details in between as pertain to our lives, how events in our lives necessarily fit into the plan. And we're going to find out one day, and sometimes we have a little bit of insight. In hindsight, we'll look back at our life. But sometimes when we're in the middle of things, especially painful things, we don't necessarily know um, how that all fits in. And so this attitude of trusting God and realizing that there's a reason behind these things is something that I think that we, we really can learn from. Um, for a minute, I want to look at this story. And it's a story um, in John chapter 9. <clears throat> if you turn there for a second. John chapter 9, verse 1. And he, he Jesus, passed by. He saw, uh, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, it was not that, the, this, that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This man was born blind. We don't know how old exactly he was, but he was, uh, he was of age. We're going to see later on that 
when the Jews are questioning the man and they question his parents, his parents out of fear, refer them back to the man and say, why don't you go ask him, he's of the age. So, I mean, they, you know, in the Hebrew culture, it was 13 and older. The Bible refers to him as a man, so I'm, I doubt he's 13. So he is, um, he's been blind for a long time. So the question that the disciples asked Jesus was, whose fault is this? Who sinned? Is it this man himself or his parents? That those were the, that's, what, that's what the point of reference. Somebody sinned and caused this blindness, and, uh, and that's, they're trying to find out, right? And what Jesus says is amazing here. He says, it wasn't them. It wasn't this, that this man sinned or his parents that the works of God might be displayed in him. This man was created blind by God for a purpose. Did he suffer? He did. He might have been begging for, as far as uh, his occupation, he probably couldn't work. He didn't get to see the beauty of creation, the colors, right? He didn't see things that we take for granted because we have sight. It wasn't his fault. Jesus said specifically, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was for that time, for that purpose, he suffered. Do we accept that? If you have a chronic illness, or if you have a child that is sick, or if you struggle financially, or if you hated by your friends. I don't know what your tra the tragedy in your life is, but is there, and you don't know why. What do we do with that? Do we just throw it back in God's face in disbelief and unbelief? Or do we say, I don't know why, Lord, but you do. And maybe you created me blind for a time such as this. So I want to finish with something unusual. This is a prayer, but this isn't a prayer found in the Bible. This is called a prayer of peace by St. Francis. And I'm going to try to make it through this prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me be love. Let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant me that I, that I may not much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Maybe we have an attitude like that to make ourselves useful to our Lord. Thank you.